before the Occupy movement, social inequality was not discussed. Everybody was discussing the debt and the austerity and all those kinds of things. What Occupy was kind of saying, we've got to actually look at these levels of social inequality. Why is it that these people earning $3.57 you know, million dollars a year are living the way they are and the rest of us have nothing? Why is it that austerity is being taken out of us and they are not having to take anything? In fact, the Republican Party wants to give the, the, three, the, the top 1% even better, even more, more tax breaks. And we're saying this is wrong and we're going to resist this. And in a sense, what I think the Occupy movement hoped to do, and still hopes to do, is to start to speak for all of those people who are trying to live on $30,000 uh, a year in New York City, and to speak to them. Now, this is very, they're very difficult to organize because, of course, they're living in temporary work. Uh, they form what, uh, in some circles now, is called the precariat. They're not a proletariat, they're a precariat. Uh, the temporary labor, insecure jobs, uh, uh, in jobs that are very difficult to unionize. And I think that uh, the Occupy movement is, is, I think, on the cusp of trying to reach out to all of the people who are actually creating the city and building the city and saying, we have to create an alternative city here. And we can do it in New York City if all of the people, other than the 1%, get together politically and start to use our political power uh, to, to do something radically different. And the Paris Commune was very important because during the, during the 1850s and 1860s, this vast redevelopment project was, was occurring in Paris. And the effect of that redevelopment project, uh, as is happening also in some cities these days, is the, is the poor and the working class were essentially being expelled from the city. And, and that working class kind of began to think in the following terms, we, we are building this city, but we can't live in the city we've built. And so there came a kind of a, uh, a movement in the late of the 1860s where the working class that was now out on the periphery occasionally would reinvade the city and say, we want to get back our city, the, build the city we built. And, and that sentiment became very, very strong. And then there was a sort of total breakdown of government in, a, in, in the war with, uh, with Prussia uh, in 1870-71. And, and at some point or other, the working class came back into the city and essentially took it over and said, look, we're going we're gonna to create our own kind of world here. We're going to create our own, our own city, our own form of government. government. And, and it, it became the Paris Commune, and, and it was a very, very interesting thing. Unfortunately, it only lasted about uh, 60 days or 80 days or something like that before the forces of reaction assembled a vast army and invaded the city and killed a lot of people and killed a lot of maybe 30,000 people uh, in, in retaking the, the city from, uh, from the radical, uh, radical. But the Paris Commune was a communal effort to redefine what the city was about in a completely different image and to reoccupy the city that they had made. I think the, the, the Occupy movement uh, showed uh, persistence, which I think is very good. We've had a lot of movements over the last 15 years that have sort of been one-day movements, you know, massive demonstrations uh, like February the 15th of 2003 against the war, millions of people on the streets all around the world, but then it sort of disappeared. The Occupy movement, I think, was, was great because it stayed in place and, 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 and tried to ensure that it was not going to go away. In so doing, of course, it called forth eventually strong police repression. Uh, and in, in the United States, this was pretty much coordinated. And my impression is that to the degree that the Occupy was beginning to affect uh, the way politics was viewed in the United States, the top 1% got very, very nervous. The Wall Streeters know what they've done. They know they're, they're responsible. They know that if they're called to account, they'll be in deep trouble. And so nobody's called them to account as yet. And neither the Republicans nor the Democrats will call them to account unless there is a mass movement saying, call these people to account. And I think they're dead scared, actually, of a mass movement of that kind, which is why they've responded to the Occupy movement in a way they've never responded to the Tea Party movement, which is immediate re police uh, repression. So there's going to be a battle fought now to keep spaces open in New York City, for example, where Occupy activities can occur. Right now, there's an attempt to stop all of them so that public spaces are not open for our kind of public uh, to do work in. It's becoming very, very difficult now. Uh, and we tried on May 1st uh, to liberate some spaces. And so there was a free university, for example, in Madison Square Park in New York City, which was actually a, a great success. So 
there's, there's going to be a, have to battle fought and it's going to have to be a long-term battle and I think that the Occupy people are not going to go away. I think they're looking for ways uh, to turn what, turn what they were doing you know, into, into a much, much uh, longer-term movement and I have the impression that is true in Britain as well and, and certainly it's true in other cities in, in, in the United States. So we're likely to see a, a resurgence of the Occupy movement uh, of, uh, including the indignados in Spain and, and, and the Syntagma Square in Athens, we'd like to see, uh, I think, coordinated action, global action.